Okay, um, hello everyone. To the side, to the side. Um, it's great that you were able to come here tonight. Um, today, as you know, Florian Wille uh, is here to present about his um, time after studying here at Hartmut, Hartmut Esslinger's class and uh, will tell us how a bit about his struggles in the first part and in the second part um, he will tell us or speak about how to lead a design team but also how to create one yeah and yes just a short information about him so he uh, worked at Schindler's for some years and is currently like he's an in industrial and interaction designer and is currently teaching in Zurich. Yes. Geht das? Oh. Hi. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I was invited to talk on my take on leading a design team, as this is a talk once, I held once, and I think you saw it on the website, and, but, and then I decided I, I'd like to talk about something different. <laughs> because I think most of you are, you're studying right now, most of you. I guess, hands up, who's studying right now? Who, who's a designer? Architect? Just because they know me? <laughs> so I thought a, a lot of you might struggle with the same things I struggled while I was a, a student. Uh, I, I would think, how the hell will I make it once I get out of this building? So I thought, I'm going to tell you my story of smart choices lucky coincidences and broken bones. Um, sort of how I got from being born in Tyrol to leading a design team and, and teaching at the art school. So we start at the very, very beginning. I'll be fast, we're not gonna, it's gonna be quick. But I was, I was born in, in Tyrol in 1980. And at the age of about six, I decided I wanted to become an inventor and a pilot. I didn't have an icon there. Um, wait. Yeah, and when pu puberty, I thought I want to become really good in something. Wait, this is not working well. Is working better? Yeah. So I was always very pragmatic, so I didn't quite care too much about what I'm good at. I was just convinced I want to be good in something. So I dedicated the next couple of years trying to figure out what I'm good at. And first thing I did was I went to uh, HTL. It was like a technical school for, for furniture building. So people who know the HTL will realize that it usually just lasts four years, five years. Um, <laughs> to that in a second. When I was around 16, I started making websites. I was the third person about in our village who had a modem. And I thought, oh, that's fun. That was the first time I realized that designing stuff makes fun, or is fun. Then I had to repeat my fourth year at HTL because I never delivered anything on time. So you might see now that the bubbles with the light bulb is always the moment when I figure something out. So I learned the hard way that how to deliver things on time, which really helped me later in my life, but it cost me one year in hotel. A year later, I could, I was uh, 
I had the honor to, to participate in the design competition and represent my school. It was nothing fancy with the Adler Lacke Retro Design Wettbewerb, but I realized that it it is a lot of fun to design things, and I realized I might be good at it, because people sort of gave me brochures for the new design university in St. Pölten and so on. So that was how I got pushed a bit into that direction. So next thing, out in the wild, I started working at the Tiroler Landestheater, as a stage carpenter for three months because I had the army service coming up. Uh, and I decided not to do that. And so thought I, I, I heard that you can go abroad and do your social service abroad. And as a pragmatic person, I thought, shall I go to New York or Dharamsala or any of the other places, everyone wants to go. And where you have an average to wait for three, four, five years. I thought, no, no, no. I look for an interesting niche. Apparently, no one wants to do his civil service in Pakistan. So that's where I went. Uh, I worked for the SOS Children's Villages, in first in Islamabad, then in Musafarabad. Musafarabad is the capital of uh, Azad Kashmir. Azad means free, so apparently only the Pakistanis call that part Azad Kashmir. Um, and I was building furniture there. Uh, then I really got into troubles with my boss. Uh, I had a bit of a trouble with uh, authorities. So she sent me to Lahore, which which is a bit like being in the Catholic Church being demoted to Rome. It's really nice there. And it's a, it's a cultural center of Pakistan. It, it was great. It was the best thing ever. Happened to me till then. And uh, I was teaching woodwork there. I was doing their websites. It's, I had a great boss, the founder of the Esther Children's Villages in Pakistan. But as you see on the timeline, this was around 2001. And Around September, it became really uncomfortable in Pakistan. As 9-11 um, happened, and the US were sort of threatening Pakistan. If they, weren't, if, they, if they were not about to support them, they would, according to the president back then, in his uh, memoirs he wrote, uh, Pakistan, uh, the US threatened to bomb Pakistan back to the Stone Age if they wouldn't support them. So uh, we were asked to leave the country. And I got a new boss. I managed to go to the nearby settlement of the Tibetans. And I worked, uh, not for the Dalai Lama himself, but I was working for the Tibetan government in exile. Um, and that was a really interesting time again. Uh, I was able to design a lot of stuff. Apparently, India is full of engineers, but there are very few people who design things, logos and shops and brochures. And so uh, I was very welcome, because I was also for free for them. So well, things I learned during that time, among other things like never eat something that's not peeled or cooked, uh, is to, to navigate in these very different uh, structures, office structures, like the very hierarchical office structure in Pakistan. I had this almighty boss, whatever she said that happened, and we had no structure in, in the Tibetan office. It was a very open, everyone could bring his opinion onto the ta to the table, and, and nothing ever happened, and it was way harder to, to get somewhere. Uh, so I think my biggest takeaway back then was how to deal with these very complex social structures in, in the workplace. I had one workmate in Dharamsala who was a really difficult person. He 
he was sort of, um, he was actually a nice guy, I discovered later, but he was someone uh, who would always tell me how to do things in a very particular way. He would always say, oh, no, no, you, you must not, someone helped us to make pictures, promotion pictures, and I would do a little favor for them and save a few of their images on my hard drive to then burn them on a CD. And he said, no, 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 you can't do this. Computer will get slow. And he, I thought he never quite got the picture of what I tried to do. And, and, and I thought, oh, he's just stupid. And everyone else thought he's stupid. And he realized that we thought he's stupid. And that's why he was being nasty to us. And, 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 and it was really difficult to work for him. And at some point, I started meditating in the morning. And after meditating 45 hours, 45 minutes every day for about a week, I realized I could really deal with that person. And I realized that he was till then probably my biggest teacher in how to deal with people in the way that and it, it helped me a lot throughout my whole career then that he was always against everything I did till I realized or till I started to include his ideas into whatever I did. Like the takeaway was I would design a table, I realized I need to make some holes that the air can come out. I saw that the background image on his computer was the Botala Palace in Lhasa. So I thought, oh, he's really into Tibet. No, obviously, everyone was running around with free Tibet t shirts. Um, so I made the outline of Tibet, a grid of Tibet, and then I told him, look, because you're so much, like Tibet seems to be really, I mean, it's very obvious, but Tibet, you got me, the, gave me the idea that I should include Tibet into this design of this table. And from that moment on, he was, like everyone who came into the office said, look at this table, you see what this is? And everyone said, well, a table. And he said, no, 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 lack of awareness. This is Tibet. And I started doing this with almost every decision, design decision, from that point on that I always said, you know, two weeks ago you told me that you like this and that, or you gave me an idea to, to include this or that. And all of a sudden I had a supporter. This is sort of a, a, a trick I've been using now for the last 15 years to take my biggest opponent's arguments and turn them into showing them how their arguments supported my design decisions, and realize that it's really hard for people to be against something that they inspired. Um, that is like the short takeaway to this long story. Wait, that was too quick. Next thing I did, I came home, and you'll see that there's a bit of a gap here. I came home and I was very, very inspired and, and I had a lot of energy and I just came back from, from India and Asia where everyone really liked my work because I was for free and, and everyone really valued what I did and, and then I came back home and no one wanted to employ me. Uh, like the, the, I was living in Innsbruck at the time, so the good furniture shops there, um, they thought I'm after little experience. And the bad one thought, like the IKEA and, and all those, where there's basically no one supporting you, where you go in and you assemble everything yourself, they thought, why should we hire you? You're gonna be bored in two weeks. It's not, you're, gonna, you're gonna, not gonna be happy and, and if you're gone in two months, we are not gonna be happy either. Uh, so I stumbled upon a really nice furniture shop after about eight, many, eight, eight months being unemployed. It was the Eames chair symbolizing the nice furniture shop, MG Interiors in Innsbruck. And I was really happy to be able to then make schematics of interior and, 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 and every week or so a person stumbled into the shop because it's very new and no one knew that it existed. And I was happy for a couple of months and then I realized that I was the first employee in their office and I didn't have too much to do because, as I said, no one knew that the shop existed and about half a year later they had to let me go. Because it's just, they couldn't, I didn't earn much, but they, they just couldn't afford me anymore because it, it was dead. And then I went to Xlutz, which is this icon here. 
selling really cheap furniture. And within the first weekend, I had to, I sold more furniture than a half a year before. I was overrun by people. And I think till today, working for Lutz for four months was one of the most valuable lessons I, I learned so far. It really helped me. Uh, we could, we'll go to that later. It really helped me later on. Um, they really gave me good training. I, I had a bad conscience because I felt they were training me longer than I worked there because I already had, <laughs> I already had a, a job lined up in Switzerland later on. So I knew I was just going to be there for, for three months. And, and I got a, uh, this, this classical salesman training you get when you go to a company like that where they tell you what words to use and what words not to use. Uh, like you never say a room is small, or small is, is it's compact. Things are not expensive, they're high value. They're not cheap. They're, how would you say, preiswert? <laughs> Affordable? Yeah, exactly. So uh, at first I thought it's a scam, but, sham, but it, it, it really helps to, to be very conscious with your language. And it really helped me later on to, to if I see a person and, and I talk to the person and he keeps referring to, yeah, I don't feel this is not right, or uh, I don't have to to, to differentiate, is, is this someone I need to show something to, to give something to, to grab, or keep on talking? Is someone, this differentiation between visual people, auditive people, tactile people, uh, really helped me later on. And also an important lesson I realized, I learned to, to seeing people when they, when they want when is the point when they want to sell want to buy something i watched a lot of my colleagues later on trying to sell people stuff when i already saw they already made their decision and this is it was a very valuable lesson to to see see when you in in in, in Lutz they called it the abschlussstärke meaning realizing when someone when is the point where someone wants to buy something you just gave them the contract and, and you wouldn't believe how many people do not know when that moment has come. And then I went to Switzerland. In a bit lower down in, in Dharamsala, I met a Swiss interior designer in a coffee shop. And we became good friends. We still good friends. I'm his best man. and, and uh, Godfather to his third child now, and he was the first person who said, ah, I know a guy who just needs someone like you. So it was when I lost this job. And I was working then for a company called Elf Elf. Um, it's a really nice guy, Beat Hubila. He's a furniture designer, model builder, and um, he has this weird connection to the number 11. That's why he called his his company, Elf Elf, every day when we were sitting in the office at 11 o'clock, 11 minutes past 11, I mean, he would say, Elf Elf. And he really taught me two very Swiss things. Be on time, be precise. Sounds trivial, but it's a key to success, being punctual and being precise. Harpen Deslinger once told us the only reason why he got the Louis Vuitton contract was he was the only one who delivered on time. Well, that was 2005, and that's about five years after I graduated from like uh, A-levels. And I heard of a thing that's called Selbsterhalter Stipendium. And I thought, well, now I should be the time to have the four years complete for, to get that Selbsterhalter Stipendium. Because I all wanted to study, but I didn't want to work and study. And, and uh, my sister struggled hard studying and working because then you just progress way slower. So I got 
uh, a stipend, something you can really, but it sounds trivial, but uh, if you happen to have worked for a couple of years, the Selbsterhalter stipendium is amazing. I've never seen any other country that has that. And I applied to a couple of art universities. The Angewandte, I'm not sure if they still have that. They, the application is a week before, it used to be a week before, before the start of the semester. Is it, is it still like that? Oh, great. That early, crazy. Well, I, I thought uh, I won't risk it and, and go to Angewandte and not get in and then have to wait for another year. So I too went to another couple of prestigious schools, like <laughs> the new design university in St. Pölten. And I got a place there, then I did, I thought it's a good warm up. They, they're, they're was, their application was the first one. Then I went to Linz and uh, would have gotten in, and then I was super relaxed coming to Angewandte. And I remember I was again very pragmatic and a bit of a dick. I went in and I sat down and we got our tasks and I was drawing and I looked around and I thought, ah, I have to be better. Like half of the people applied, I thought, they probably thought, they heard of industrial design, they're not really in for it. I thought half the people probably are not such hard competition. That I just need to be better than every other. Like I need to be the best of four back then. And I thought I just need to be better than one of the other good ones. Which is in retrospect quite a dick thing to say. And I thought, I looked around and thought, ah, oh, easy, I'm in. And then the second day, third day, I got up on my way to the toilet. I looked over the table in the other room and realized, fuck, the, the, all the good people were on the other side. <laughs> um, but I was lucky I got in. But I was, really, I was the only person from my half of the Piva studio who got in. So that gave me false confidence. <laughs> mm. So I'm gonna go very quickly through the steps I went through while I was studying. Because I started and I started studying in, in class Piva because I thought, I'm doing furniture, he's doing furniture. It's very obvious that I'll go for him. Also, I didn't realize that the other studio was Ross Lovegrove, who was into furniture as well, but I, I missed that. And within the first couple of weeks, I realized, wait, there's... Of all of design, furniture is more the, the boring part. So the first thing I did was uh, a submarine for one person. And that was the very, very first project. No, it was not the very first. We did this, um, this uh, airport cabin, a uh, shower for the airport. That was the first thing we did as a short project. But this was my first semester project. Uh, and I figured out I might just keep doing one topic per year. So as I did the, the solar sub, I, in the second semester I did a swimming hotel. So let's stay with water. And I thought I have to plan to just figure out what I want to do or what I don't want to do during my studies. So each year I tried something. By the end of year one, I thought there must be a more challenging environment than that's, that sounds really bad now, but there must be a more challenging environment in the PIVA class. And I looked for, for, for more drive and, and luckily this guy turned up and changed a lot. And I had no idea who he is, but I, I watched him half teaching for half a year and I thought, oh, he has a good drive. I, I switched to that class. Then I started doing a piano that looks like a Lamborghini. Then I did a car with Philip, who's in the last row over there. Uh, and then was already time for my intermediate diploma, and I did a scooter. So I spent my third year doing transportation design, and realized I think I'm not made for transportation design. There are so many people who are so much better than me, 
And it's sort of a dull but challenging field. So I, I was looking for something else. So I, sort of the, the subway was fun. The instruments were sort of fun. The invitation was fun, but I was still looking for my niche. And in my seventh semester then, um, I was lucky enough to really have a good team. And we did a robot. Uh, that was a robot that would roll into buildings and knock down stuff. It's a real boys, boys toy. And I got the realization, I seem to be really good in managing teams. Back in that year, it was really interesting. Usually, Stefan <laughs> would always, when you assemble a team, he would always then go and pick the good teams apart and put some first semester students in. And I, like the biggest part of my studies, I was, I was having first semester students at my site. And at some point, I just thought, OK, I, I'm just going to assemble the best team I could ever get. And then he might take one, pe one person away, but we will still be good. And that was the one year they didn't do that. So the eighth best students were assembled in two teams who were battling really hard, both making a robot. And the other students, for the first time, didn't have some person like me or Lucas or, or someone else who, who really is micromanaging everyone on their side, and they really flourished all of a sudden. It was a win-win situation for everyone. So I realized I like managing people. I was sort of, back then I was good in modeling, but my main, my main focus was keeping the four people together. And, and the reason why we at the end managed to finish the robot and our big competitors, Lucas team didn't, was simply time management, a thing I learned in the hotel. After that, Hartmut came to me and said, ah, I have an internship in India. Why don't you go to India and do an internship? And he said, there is an office in, in Bangalore. So I called one of my closest friends who's sitting in the third row, who was at the time working in Chennai. Uh, and I thought, hey, I might come to Bangalore. That's very close, isn't it? And he said, yeah, just a five hours drive. And then two weeks later, Hartmut comes again and, and says, no, no, sorry, I was completely wrong. It's in Chennai. So realizing that the office was 150 meters away from David's flat, his flatmate moved out two weeks before I came. Everything fell into place really nicely. I came to Chennai, lived right next to my office with my best mate. And I spent the half a year there doing interaction design. And uh, I have this long history of doing websites. Wherever I went, I did a website. I did a website for Edith Zwei back then. I did a website, well, let's put it the other way around. The only place I didn't do a website for was XXXLoads. But all the other places I ever worked for, I did the website for. And at some point, someone told me, come on, don't fight it. You're just an, an interaction guy. So that's why I went for that. For that uh, internship to India. I thought I'm going to join a big design team. I came there, arrived there, and realized I am the design team. It was a company with about 35 people, 35 engineers, uh, making mobile phone applications for navigation. Now, here, the iPhone was invented. So what we, are what we are designing for were tiny Windows mobile phones with, I think, 320 on 180 pixel size screens. That's the size of an icon today. Uh, but I did learn a lot. And by the end of it, I thought, uh, why don't I go to study interaction design somewhere? So I have on like what I'm practicing now for years. Uh, so I have an academic foundation for it. And I did uh, apply to all sorts of places. I looked for every, like Glasgow and Umea and 
also Zurich University of the Arts, where I didn't especially want to go, as I have been in Zurich already. But I was three months after the application, and through some lucky coincidence, my portfolio landed on the desk of uh, Dr. Kamen Franinovich, who was about to become the lead of the Interaction Design Studio in Zurich. And she really liked it. And I, even though I was way too late, they, I got uh, an Erasmus position there. And as soon as I arrived there, I realized why she liked having an industrial designer around. Because the way interaction design is taught at the Zurich University of the Arts is a lot with uh, embodied interaction, they call it. Sort of the interaction is not just happening on the screen, it's, it's wearable devices, it's, it's using your whole body to interact. So the first thing I did there was a helmet. And I realized there's a really interesting field somewhere in between industrial and interaction design. And that's where I started to focus on. I think that's going to be a video about that helmet, which I, I'll skip that. Um, it, it was basically was a helmet that when you go into a tunnel, there was a light sensor and it would switch on automatically. And when you wanted to go left and right, you just do this. Uh, I got a nickname, it called the Spasti Helm. The industrial designers in, in Zurich called it that. But I thought it, there must be a better option than like reaching out with your hand. And uh, then they asked me to stay. That was interesting. I was just about to go back to Vienna to do my, to do finish my studies. And they asked me to stay as, uh, contrary to my perception, they thought I bring a good spirit to the class. While I, the whole year felt that I'm behind, I can't program as well, I can't, it wasn't as tech savvy as they were, uh, but because I couldn't program, I was always the guy doing the design, which is a very visible part of every project. And that's why all the, the lecturers thought I'm a, I'm a good driving force, so that's, the off that's why they offered me to stay. Um, and that was my bachelor project there. I did a robot that talks to old people. Um, there's a quick... So, we wanted to make a robot for old people, so we interviewed them, figuring out who they talked to, and realized that they have very little connection to their nieces and nephews. So we wanted to make an interface for them that wasn't like a screen and keyboard type thing, but something that could read out messages. So we made mock-ups, and video scenarios to figure out how to do it. We placed the, the cardboard thing then in their home to figure out where they would place it, how they would change it, and then we built it. We built uh, uh, the first, no, that was already a second test. It basically has a face tracking camera so it could look at you. It has a touch screen on the front, so you could tap on it, and it, You would read your messages aloud. Let's go back, sir. You would read your messages aloud. So you could write a text message or, a, or an email, and it would appear as a letter on their head. And if you tap on it, it would read it aloud. You could send a, a spoken message back. And it had all sorts of sensors, capacitive sensors, so you could navigate through. And it was really working, sort of. Was my, it was working. It was. 90% working, let's say. It had this uh, annoying thing that the, the, the server was very weak, the motors, so I got tired after a while, and, and after about half an hour, it always would do this. <laughs> but apart from that, it was working. So, now, at about the same time when I was finished there, I started up a hobby. Now you might ask, why the hell is he talking about his hobbies? Um, well, it will become apparent in a second. Um, I always wanted to fly. And when I was 30, when I was done with my studies, after I did my 
license in paragliding, I realized, and I got offered my first job, I realized that my, my boyhood dreams of becoming a pilot and becoming an inventor became reality through being an industry designer and interaction designer is sort of being an inventor. And flying a paraglider is being a pilot. So I was really happy for about a month till I realized how dangerous paragliding is. I got uh, about, uh, I mean, it was years later, but on about the spot where you st that you see right now, uh, I, I had my first paragliding accident. Uh, I got, I tried to start, and I, uh, a very strong wind gust ripped me away and threw me through the air about 50 meters. Uh, that resulted in a bruised back. I had two water bottles in my back, so I had two bruises in the shape of water bottles here. A really bad whiplash and a really heavy concussion. Heavy enough to have lost the memory of about that day. I woke up in a computer tomography machine and um, with that I came back to Angewandte to make my diploma. And that was really hard because I just had a heavy concussion about two weeks before my diploma started and the side effect of having a heavy concussion is that you have a very bad memory your focus really suffers and for about the first three weeks of my studies I I was convinced that I won't make it this year um, and the funny thing was, the, uh, I went to the Zentralfriedhof with a friend of mine. Now the Zentralfriedhof is like the nicest place to have walks in Vienna, I feel. And, and I, I told her, if I'm not having a breakthrough within the next week, I'm going to quit my diploma, I'm going to wait for half a year, and then do it relaxed. With all the pressure gone, a funny thing happened, I went home, and... I basically made a sketch that outlined my whole diploma within 20 minutes. So I spent the next four months, three months, making a robot again for, for kids this time. So I'm going to show that video quickly. Well, it's, I thought it's people are staring at the screens and that's... Uh, it's sort of boring, couldn't we turn our whole environment into an interface by having a robotic agent kids could carry around with them and it would project when it's dangerous, they could help them get home. <coughs> and, and sort of a little companion. And Hartmut wanted me to make a transformer. That was his... He said, make a transformer. And I thought, I don't want to make a transformer, I want to work for IDEO and do user-centered design and stuff. Uh, but Hartmut was a stubborn person, so... I figured out a way to do user-centered design and make a transformer uh, and, and did this as my, as my final project. And, and then it was over. The wonderful five and a half years of study. And, and now starts the part that you probably came for. <laughs> What, what was I doing once I finished here? Um, I had the goal to be finished with my studies in my 30s, like in my 20s before I turned 30. No, I want to be done. I, thought I don't want to be older than 30. And I had my, got my diploma three days before my 31st birthday, so, so that was check. And I wanted to work uh, for, for, for frog design or IDO or whatnot, but before I even could start to write an application, my old professor in Zurich offered me a job at the Zurich University of the Arts. And I thought, what the hell, this is not what I planned, but let's go for it, it's just a 40% position. 
working with smart materials. Thought this is this is an interesting. I actually wanted to go for holidays. I realized through starting paragliding I couldn't afford holidays anymore. And I thought, okay, working 40% is semi-holiday, so that's why I started in this position. And, uh, and the materials were a lot of, of uh, fun. Anyone knows what that material is or could be? No. Nah. It's yeah, it's sort of it's it's an electroactive polymer. It's we built structures out of it. It's 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 a membrane coated with nano car carbon nanoparticles on the front and the back, and then you put five thousand volts through it and then it compresses and it acts as like a muscle. So for a couple of for a couple of months, I was experimenting with with artificial muscles, which was was a lot of fun. Um, once the research project was um, was uh, over, I found myself in a, uh, how do you say a research assistant position and teaching assistant position, and I started teaching all the sort of industrial design-like parts in the interaction design department. Uh, I did a research project with the EPFL where we were working on robots again, as this is my favorite topic. Um, the guy over there was one of the leading roboticists of Switzerland. But we acted out how, how might uh, a, object, a robotic object work that's, that's collecting toys. And we acted that out and that resulted then in a, in a map of a behavioral map for, for robots. And, and then that research project didn't get promoted or didn't like lost funding. And I felt that I didn't study industrial design to become a teacher. And I was at the same time also a bit too lazy to actively look for a job. And then someone called me and offered me one. I said, like, why don't you come to Schindler Creations? No, it, uh, back then it was called Dominic Schindler Creations with that dreadful logo. And I asked, why don't you come to us and become an interaction design team lead. A position I would have never dared to, to apply, but they apparently put enough faith in me. And I was struggling for almost half a year. Should I take it, should I not? And, uh, and then I, I remembered, I mean, many people, especially people in my office, hate me for quoting uh, Hartmut Esslinger every now and then. But he said, don't go where everything is working already, go where you can, can can make an impact. So I thought, well, that Schindler creation thing that looks really odd, but it seems to have a lot of potential. It's, it seems to be a place where you can do stuff. So that's why I went to Dominic Schindler Creations. And I thought, I'll stay here. I might get him to drop that stupid name, and maybe we can do something about the logo. And back then, it was um, a really cool place for industrial de designers. They they did a lot of of designs for for heavy machines like CNC milling machines and and turning machines and pharmaceutical machines. And it was a big boys club there. They had one office in at Lake Constance in Lauterach, and when I came there, I had a team of three, like three me included. So I had one visual designer, one industrial designer who really was into interaction design, and and me, and the rest of the office was doing stuff like that, really masculine 
heavy machines in honor. I must say, for that part of the industry, unprecedented level. They also did, whenever there was not enough work, which was hardly ever back then, they did stuff like that, that was designed by Claudia Baer, who was a classmate of ours and, and who I would have never thought I would go in, in, in such a direction. But it was a good place if you want to become good in, 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 in surface modeling and design. Now, my task was to design an interface for CNC milling and turning machines. And it was by far the largest contract that company had so far in industrial design, interaction, well, in interaction design. So I had two people and me making a project that was about 600 man days large and we had to do that within six months. So for half a year, I didn't sleep too much. Uh, it was really stressful, a lot of fun, and it culminated in the EMO, which is a, a big exhibition for the heavy machine industry, and and once I had the final prototype in my hand, I thought, I need to click through it, and, and it takes you about five to 10 minutes to figure out all the kinks and, and, and details of the software, and I thought, I spent 12 hours a week, 13 hours a week for half a year for this little piece of software. And, and I felt, I was a bit disappointed. And then I came to, I flew up to the, to Hanover, to the exhibition, and I, got out of the airport, and the first thing I see is, the software is called Celos. I came out of the airport, and the first thing I saw, DMG Mori, Celos. I, thought, uh -huh. I went down, and every wall that you could pit, uh, put a poster on made advertisement for the software we just made. And I was aware that the, our client was one of the larger manufacturers of, of milling machines, but I wasn't quite aware of the size of that company back then. So this is the complete, I think it's hall number four or five at, uh, at the EMO. The, 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 the area back there we can get food is bigger than the second largest exhibitor there. There's 180 different kinds of machines, each and every single of them designed by Schindler. And the thing you see up there at the end where this tail is written were four panels blew up by the factor of four that were demonstrating what we just did the last half year. So I must say I, I felt a bit of gratitude then <laughs> where I thought, ah, oh, okay, that paid off. And uh, what we did with with the Stelos, we Oh, I need to speed up a bit. Uh, what we did with this is we created sort of, uh, an, sort of an iOS for machines, like all the processes around milling uh, you could deal with. You, could, you have a digitalized workflow from you get your 3D data, you make NC data out of it, and then you, you, you know where all your parts are. You, it, the whole thing is digitalized and it helps you in each and every step. And for a weird reason, no one on the market was able to copy that for, for many years. I've been to an exhibition two years ago, and, and, and the guys there of the biggest competitors said, oh, you know, it's really annoying. A couple of years ago, they came up with this Scylla software, and now we're all running around like headless chicken. And, and it's, it really threw everything, put everything upside down, and I thought it's... It's really weird because it was not that revolutionary, if you look at it. So after that really stressy half year, uh, we got an even larger contract to go into uh, designing the CNC software, the programming software itself. That took us about three years. And I flew to Japan about five times a year. and. 
that was that was great fun. That was a uh, it was really really exhausting, but it was it was really interesting working with such different in such a different uh, environment with such a different working culture and communication culture. So on the topic of flying, I was still paragliding at the time. And that was Pinkston, 2015. That was my, my best flight ever. I went from Landeck in Tirol to Schkoll in Switzerland. Here, where it's red, I was on four and a half meet, thousand meters in the altitude. And the train I might recognize that where the red axis, there is a very steep decline. Uh, I got into a very unlucky situation there that ended really painfully. Um, about 20 meters off the ground, my glider collapsed completely, went underneath me, I fell down, dislocated my hip, and shattered my hip. So by now you must say, or must feel, oh, he's really a bad pilot. Um, and I am. Uh, but I'm also a very unlucky one. I know people who fly way worse than I, and they're still healthy. But, but I was the very unlucky combination of ambition and not too good. Um, and when I was, while I was lying in the hospital and they told me that my hip was shattered and I have to put it into place again, and if, it's, if they bend it and it jumps out again, I have to get an operation and that it would take me three months to be able to walk again. I woke up after the, the, the how do you call it? Narcosa? Anesthesia. Anesthesia, and I realized I had a bolt through my knee, and I was happy for a second because I thought, okay, I really have, I have holidays, three month holidays, I can't work now. That was when I realized I have to change something in the way I work. And so I, I left my team on its own, more or less, for three months. And I learned to let go a little. And when I came back after three months, I had a very different team waiting for me. People who I was always looking over the shoulder and correcting them and micromanaging them, all of a sudden were doing great work on their own. And so that was like my first big bump in the learning curve that I must not micromanage people once a team exceeds a certain size. So I came back and we started doing a couple of really great projects. Then one of my favorite is the one for Doppelmayr, um, elevators, how do you call them? Cable cars, uh, which was really a really nice collaboration. And, and I changed the way I was leading my design team. I was not, I was establishing, I, I was focusing on the parts I was good at. Through working at Lutz, I was really good in selling stuff, selling ideas, selling concepts, and I got that contract, I worked the first couple of weeks with them, and then I gave it into the design team. <coughs> My design team back then was consisting of <laughs> Philip, who's in the last row, me. These were the two guys I started with, and that was a student of mine. He used to be a student of mine. Every November, we would grow, let our mustaches grow. Uh, and did a, a Movember photo shoot. So that was a bit an older picture. So by the time the team grew up to 12 people, having the handlebar again, this is Dominic Schindler, me back there. And we decided that the women from Movember were having a monobrow. <laughs> you see here. So also these two pictures symbolize a bit the change that happened. In that time, I was 
going a bit more into the background and and trying to lead my team differently. By this time, also the appearance changed a bit through again getting people like Philip on board, who was studying with me, the guy who did the, the car with me. Uh, we were able to get rid of the old logo and instead of an industrial design company, we slowly managed to turn Schindler into a user experience company. And doing, creating, designing the experience through industrial design, interaction design, and service design. So by that time, we had a second office in Lake Zurich that I built up. And we were a team of 11 people, like the design team itself was 11 people. And that was all very, very exhausting. So about two years ago, I had my second break. My batteries were low. At one point in August 2015, I got up in the morning and, no, the thing was I was not getting up in the morning. I woke up and I realized I don't have enough energy to get out of bed. And I called Tom, or I called at the office and I said, look, I'm not feeling good. I, I'll stay at home today. After three days, I went to the doctors and told them, uh, like they were checking me, and then I said, hey, you look really healthy, but may I ask how you work? And then I told them about my environment, how many hours I do. And I said, ah, you seem to be exhausted. Stay home for another couple of weeks. So the upper couple of weeks turned into three months. I went to Ayurveda retreats, I went to doctors, and I slowly worked my way back. And again, after three months when I came back, I had again a very different team waiting for me. And I had a very different approach to leading my team. And now after about an hour, we're coming to the title of the original title of the, of the uh, talk. The couple of principles I ran my team with. And a, a couple of things I, I employed I, I, I implemented from the very start, but a, a couple of things changed. Work with great people was something I always went for. I, when assembling a team, I always looked that the chemistry was right. I was never, well, we were never hiring jerks, even if they were brilliant. So the photo you saw, the second one, that's a team that was a team at its peak, I would say. It was a team where everyone liked the others so much. Like, like Philip put it once, it's like everyone in my office I like enough to go to holidays with. And, and that was, that was a, a, an amazing time, I must say. It was a, a really well-balanced team where skill-wise and, and, and for character-wise, it was really well-balanced. The second thing I always w went for um, as a team lead, or uh, where I saw my, my main focus was grease the cocks, be, be an enabler. I, I, I'm a bit of a workflow nerd. So I saw my, my, my main task in making sure that everyone has the right information, everyone talks to each to the right person and, and to be able to to be the grease in, in the whole in the whole process without without micromanaging people and that's already the next part which was for me the hardest one to implement. Context, not control. I used to be a team lead that was always looking over people's shoulder, was correcting their work, being very particular about everything. And at some point, I had to realize the projects were becoming too big. I didn't have the energy anymore. I had to let go to lead a team in a way that everyone knows about the context and can do the work by their own. 
without me looking over their shoulders, giving people more responsibility. A big change I made after I came back was that I started impl employing, uh, imp implementing new ways of managing my team in the way that we were working in an agile manner like software developers do. That meant that we're not planning projects two years ahead, we were working in sprints. And we convince, were able to convince uh, clients to, to work in this way with us, some of them. And, and that was, that was a, big, a big game changer for me. While I was gone, I, I was able to read books about Scrum and Agile team management, and that, that really made the difference. And it also had an imp impact on the way I managed the team, on the collaboration, on the, the sort of meetings we had. Instead of having a meeting once a week, we started having a meeting every day for five minutes. Where we were standing around on, our, on a board where we saw all our tasks, and we only answered three questions. What, what, what am I doing right now? What am I planning to do in the afternoon? And what is keeping me from doing that? And all of a sudden, people knew what the others are doing. Everyone was helping each other, and everything became more, more fluent. And now, one of the biggest tasks I had as team lead, finally, was protecting your team. As teams are fragile, and the creative process is a fragile one. And if you have people running around shouting at people, if you have angry clients calling, shouting at people, it really throws some people off, especially sensitive people, and designers very often are more on the sensitive side. So I saw my task in keeping harmful influence off of the team. So that was my, what was it, five, six principles of how I leave my team? Just to, <laughs> I felt bad making a talk without talking about that. And I realized that I, ne I, working at Schindler, I couldn't quite get up on my feet. And so about a year in advance, I told Dominic that I'm going to quit. And I gave the company a year to replace me and to hire another person. And yeah, I was sticking to that plan. And my time at Schindler, ended in May of this year, and I still miss them, I must say. It was a really, really good team. And I thought, let's do a sabbatical. But before I do a sabbatical, I just go to this one excursion with a couple of students from ZTDK. And again, I wasn't too careful, and now I'm a lecturer at ZTDK. <laughs> To conclude, uh, in the meanwhile, they moved to a new building. So it's now one of the largest uh, art universities in Europe with a really nice building. It used to be a, a, a dairy, the largest dairy in Europe. It still shows in some of the elements like the, like, like the Mensa. They have a really nice library. And they have their own cinema. And to not make it jealous, they have a whole, a whole lot of rooms without windows. Like, I, I, I constantly teach in rooms with no window to anywhere. If I'm lucky, I have a window to a hallway that has a window to the Innenhof. So it is not all great, but it's, it's generally it's, it's, it's quite nice. Uh, I'm teaching uh, uh, certified advanced studies for people from the industry about design methods, and uh, do a couple of courses, interdisciplinary courses, with, with students from uh, within the design department, scientific visualization, and industrial design, and traction design, and all sorts. Yeah, that's, that's now. Sort of conclude, if I put all my learnings on one slide, it's things I learned is to be on time, be precise, 
find out what you're good at, learn from difficult people. And it's, if things are going easier, it's nice, but you're usually not learning that much. <laughs> Incorporate others' idea of others to, to give ownership, to have more support. Understand people's needs. That's what I learned at Lutz, to not force my taste on other people. It's people who come in, and, and I first thought this is all ugly furniture, but sometimes people come in and they see, okay, it might be fitting to their needs. Be conscious with your language, and find out how to make good use of your weaknesses. Um, that's one thing I haven't talked about too much, is I was a very slow six-year-old. I was very slow even when I was 12. I was having really hard time focusing all my life. And I think I'm lucky enough to have found the one job where I can use that weakness to my advantage. Meaning, I got really organized because otherwise I wouldn't find anything anymore. I learned how to design things in a way that I could understand them. And once I understood them, sort of everyone, I was my own DAO, my dümmste anzunehmen, the user. And, and through that, I developed the capability of designing things that were easy, really easy to understand. But of course, it's. I just made the most out of it. I, I would also be happy if I wouldn't have that weakness. <laughs> and look after yourself. As the talk was also about decisions, I quickly sum up the, the, I think, smart decisions I took in my life is always going for niches and not where everyone else is working, but finding the the bits and pieces where no one pays attention to. If everyone wants to design chairs and live in Vienna, then of course it's going to be really hard to find a job. If everyone wants to become a car body designer at Audi, it's, it's, of course it's going to be really hard. But thinking that there's a lot of car interior to design that no one really takes care of and they're not that many people trying to be good at that, that would be like a smart niche to go, to in, go into. Second, look for a challenging environment. Stay in a zone that's constantly a bit uncomfortable to keep you on your feet. For me, that was definitely the ID2. We were constantly on our feet. Study with a stipend. <laughs> and stay open for opportunities. Don't get too caught up in your own dreams. When something great comes along, even if it's not the thing you were looking for, really, really consider it. It's, it's worthwhile. And go to places where you can make a difference. It's working for Apple probably would be really interesting, but I don't think that I would have changed anything if I would have ever get, gotten the opportunity to work there. That's, that's uh, a perfect suit, a perfect situation that works well without me. I don't think I could have contributed anything, but going to Schindler, I was able to really leave an imprint there. That it's a different company. And I managed to bring people into the company that also managed to really shape it. And that, that was interesting. Hard, but interesting. And I think that is it. Sorry, that was way too long. I just realized I didn't. I didn't test it. I didn't do a test run, and uh, don't worry. But <laughs> hello. <laughs> okay, don't worry. It was super exciting. At least uh, I'm pretty sure it was.
for everyone. There is something there. Can you hear me properly? Okay, hello. I think I just have to speak louder. I'm a silent speaker. Um, anyway, so thank you very much for having this time and being here. You must almost eat it. Huh? Really close. Ah, okay. Uh, all right. So again, thank you very much for having the time to be here. Um, now we would have time, some time for your questions to Florian and ask everything you want, I guess. And uh, afterwards we will conclude with a small buffet and maybe small talks. Yeah. So whoever has a question. I guess I didn't leave anything open. <laughs> <laughs> really good. <laughs> Does anyone want to ask something about these projects or? Okay, so maybe I will go for it and start with one question. Um, I mean, you spoke about challeng challenging projects already, so my question maybe it's like what was the most challenging project for you in, in terms of interesting that you learned a lot but also uh, at the same time it might have been a new field or something you had to learn but work with. It's when I was studying things were quite easy for me as, as for some weird reason I understood what Hartmut was asking of us. Like I very often got the feedback, he was never really investing much time into my projects, he always looked at it and said, oh yeah, looks good. I very often got the feedback, good so, weiter so. But there was one project that didn't work out like this and that was that one car I showed and that was really hard. I were running in circles for about three months. Couldn't figure out what he wanted of us. That was, during my studies, I think that was the most challenging project. And it's not a particularly good looking car, but I did learn a lot doing it. Uh, in my professional life, I would say the interface for the, the MAPS 5, the CNC control, that was challenging because it just went on forever. It's about 2,000 days, man days, large. And it's really hard to stay consistent in such a huge topic. And I also must admit, it's, it's a very, very dry topic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's very interesting in itself, like the, all the different function windows, what they can do and what you learn about machines. but handling such a large project that was the most, I would say it was the most challenging for me. Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh, um, now, any questions? Did you develop any habits or structures to, to get your ideas or to cost easier? Did you develop any structures or habits that that makes it easy for you to come to ideas or to uh, prototype? Sort of, yeah. The one habit is never to expect that, never to wait for the muse to kiss you. This idea that you, that ideas, they will come to you. You just, you know, you walk in the park and here it is. That never happens, or it does happen every now and then, but we can't rely on that, <laughs> not if you're working professionally. So turning up at nine, sitting at your desk, starting to work, and even if you're super uninspired, just staying there, working on something, because you must be around when the ideas come. And, they, and you never go into, you can't, it, like the first idea is, is usually, that's just the, the, the it's like a tiny flower coming, but you need to do something with that. And I often bumped into students 
uh, and, and I say, so, so how is your semester project going? Is it, oh, yeah, yeah, I have this idea in my mind, I just need to write it down. I said, but presentations in two weeks. And this idea to come, that is, this, that is something that should happen after a week. And then you spend the next three months iterating and improving that idea. So getting there, getting to your desk at nine and work, 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 and stay on the topic, stay focused. That's a habit, just to, to not think that things come easy, but to, to be there and implement stuff and iterate on them. To not have a great idea, draw it down, and that's it. You have to take an idea and go over it and improve it and refine it. And the first idea is just a rough, rough something. It's not, it's not never the thing that's going to go on to market or you can present to anyone. Yeah, be there at nine. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a follow-up question for that question, and um, it's quite selfish of me, but I'm in that exact situation right now. I have no idea what I'm doing. I have one week left until midterms, and I have no idea on what to actually work on. That, that is sort of my, my issue right now. Uh, I know the theme I'm working with, but I don't know how to apply structure to it. And so the question in essence is, if you don't know how to approach a problem, how do you approach that problem? Usually, I feel that making a bad decision in the design context is better than taking no decision. So. Knowing which direction you want to go and setting you, like time boxing. You have two weeks to go, you say? Uh, there, there's one week until midterms, yeah. One, one week? One week until midterms. Midterm. I have some stuff, but it's not <laughs> So there's this one book, this is one book about uh, the, the Google Design Sprint. Oh, yeah. So this is how you get somewhere within one week. And once you know your challenge and you, you formulate a, a, a question, I usually start with a how might we question. How might I approach a certain problem? And the how might we is already, that's a, very often that's the most difficult part because there you need to decide what to do and what not to do, what problem you want to attack. And then just follow a process of quick visualizations, quick prototyping, iterations, testing, and then you wouldn't believe where you can go in one week. Uh, when you were studying with ID2, we had a very precise method. I, I, you probably <laughs> remember. Uh, do you stick use it, still use it or stick to it still, or did you move from it? Basically, the discover, define, yeah. Deliver, exactly. I, I'm really enough. I'm teaching that method now. With uh, I'm, I'm having that uh, course design methods, and well, there's this Stanford Design Thinking double diamond that has four phases instead of three. Uh, it's basic. Yeah, there's no way around it actually. But discover, do some research, define your problem work on it and deliver something. That's, but it, back then when I started to study, I was, I realized before I started studying that I couldn't tackle problems of a certain level of complexity. And work studying at ID2 really gave me the tools to deal with that. Uh, a, a systematic approach to problems. I, I, yeah, I do still use that. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, okay. All right. We can also talk over chips and, and orange juice. And management. <laughs> uh, all right. So again, thank you all for being here. Now we open the buffet. Feel free to drink as much juice as you want. <laughs>
Um, yeah, and I hope uh, you will have some nice discussions, and I really hope you um, got some great input from Florian, at least I did, and yeah, thank you again. <laughs>